Hello, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. We are so happy to have you with us today. A lot on the show involving Glenn Schumann, the interesting chatter coming out of his potential uh, interest in an NFL job, or maybe better said, the NFL jobs interest in him, the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, what that means for Georgia, the fact that Schumann's ready to run it back with the dogs. Um, I want to talk about a subject today that if I could kind of go in-depth with Kirby on anything, I believe this might be the thing I'd want to go in-depth with him on. We'll talk about why that is. Jake Fromm's going to join the sh- uh, show. Always love that. Connor Riley's had some great stuff, uh, kind of pre-NFL draft, but also looking at who Georgia has to replace on their way to the NFL. That'll be a fun conversation with Connor Riley uh, a little bit later on today there as well. There are a couple of interesting SEC stories I want to touch on. One of them is very much off the radar, but it's Maybe kind of only interesting to me, but I'll see if I can make it interesting for y'all as well. Either way, we think we're going to have a really, really good show on hand for you. We are so glad to have you with us for it. So what do you say we get it going right now? Glenn Schumann's coming back. That's good news for the dogs. I'll give you some reasons why. Let's talk about it. As Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia, begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Dial 678-ESOG now for a solution to your foundation and waterproofing problems. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So as you know, there had been a little bit of chatter. Maybe maybe you know this. uh, I think you probably do. There had been a little bit of chatter over the last few days about the possible interest of the Philadelphia Eagles in Georgia co-defense coordinator Glenn Schumann to be its defensive coordinator. This has been out there a little bit. I believe that Dan Matthews from 6A the fan kind of reported on this, and there had been some talk about hey, the fact that Schumann's going to interview with the Eagles. And listen, I, I, I totally understand this, and I think we're all kind of in the same boat on this. Sometimes when it comes to this portion of the football calendar, it's sort of hard to know what's real. It just sort of feels like everything is just sort of, I don't know, spin zone or whatever else. The pre-draft conversation feels that way. The coaching carousel, especially the NFL version of the coaching carousel, can kind of feel that way. It's sometimes kind of hard to know what is real. Well, yesterday we kind of got a little bit of a confirmation of this in the person of Chris Lowe, who's obviously, you know, kind of a well-respected ESPN reporter, pretty plugged in all this kind of stuff. And so Lowe put this out on Twitter, maybe you read this at dognation.com, that Glenn Schumann, after interviewing for the Philadelphia Eagles defensive coordinator job, is returning to Georgia, sources tell ESPN. Uh, Lowe goes on to say, that's big news for the dogs. Schumann was co-DC and called plays last year for the two-time defending champs. And of course, Georgia had already lost Todd Munkin to the NFL. So, we were kind of left to wonder, well, is Schumann really on the uh, radar for the Philadelphia Eagles here? Are they really interested in him? And uh, Chris Lowe confirmed that I guess that really kind of was true. And uh, Schumann now reser- removing his name from consideration. We'll probably find out how real all of this really was months from now if we learn, oh, well, Glenn Schumann got this huge raise. And th- you know that would kind of sort of validate the idea that, um, hey, maybe Philadelphia really was looking at Schumann as its defensive coordinator and and, and, and Schumann choosing to stay at Georgia got a big raise for himself, that that kind of validates just how real all of this was. But nonetheless, Schumann coming back to Georgia, I believe, is really good news for UGA. Now you say, well, Pete, I don't need you to tell me that. I already know that, uh, and I understand that. That's not the most uh, complicated point that I've ever made here. But I want to kind of dive deep for a second on three reasons why I think Schumann returning to Georgia really matters for the dogs here and really, I think, sets up you know Georgia for success in the future, but also kind of, once again, kind of re-emphasizes uh, about you know kind of what makes Georgia kind of a cool, special place right now and just how well-constructed this program kind of is. And as a way of doing this, I want to go back to something that Will Muschamp, who's sort of Glenn Schumann's partner in crime here, their co-defensive coordinators together. You know, last summer, prior to the start of the season, they talked a little bit about their working relationship with each other. And you know, these are two guys that, in some respects, sort of feel kind of different here uh you know must champs the grizzled veteran he's been head coach at a couple of places in the sec he's seemingly been you know involved in constructing defensive game plans for a long time by comparison schumann is much much younger so two guys that sort of have very different kind of resumes asked to kind of team up together to work and lead the georgia defense they're going to do that again in 2023 
Uh, and what Muschamp said about Schumann back then, I think kind of sets us up for what we need to go today. This is a slightly longer clip than we normally play, about a minute long here. But nonetheless, it's Muschamp talking about why he enjoys working with Glenn Schumann, relevant because of the news that Schumann's returning. Take a listen to this. I knew of Glenn, but I didn't know really know Glenn till last year and had a wonderful working experience with he and, and Dan and Trey Scott. And obviously, Coach Smart is on the defensive side of the ball a lot. Um, but we had a, a really good rapport as far as our, you know, what we needed to do to be successful, and there's nothing's going to change with that. We have a great working relationship. Glenn's promotion, in my opinion, is very well deserved. He's an outstanding football coach. He's extremely bright. Um, he has a great rapport with his players. Uh, you know, and you really look at the, you know, Coach Smart's going in the seventh season here at Georgia. You know, the two longest tenured coaches would probably are Glenn and, and Dale McGee. And you really look over those seven years, consistency of their position groups probably is the best uh, th that's been here in those seven years. You know, arguably, I'm sure that's different years. But um, but his position has been very productive. He's recruited extremely well at his position. Uh, he's just an outstanding football coach. He has a very good understanding of what we do defensively, how we adjust things out, um, and, and he's always looking for a better way to do it and always researching those things and what can we do to get better uh, in those situations. But I really enjoy working with Glenn just because the intelligence, the football intelligence he has and the passion he brings uh, to the job every single day because those things are really important and the players see that and they understand how invested he is in them. So let me talk a little bit about that. I want to kind of pull out a, a couple of things there. On the one hand, Muschamp mentioned something about Schumann that we all know. The Glenn Schumann is just one of the great recruiters in college football. The the proof is in the pudding. You know, it's it's Troy Bowles, it's C.J. Allen, it's Raylan Wilson for this year's linebacker class. It may be Sammy Brown for the class of 2024. You know, there are guys like Smile Mondin and Jamon Dumas Johnson on the field. You know, you've got you know guys like Tresman Marshall, who I respect and think is a very good player, but he goes to a place like Alabama because of that's how hard it is to play at Georgia right now because of the talent that's been collected. It is just objectively true that Glenn Schumann is an unbelievable top-shelf recruiter, as good a recruiter for the position he's asked to recruit, as good a recruiter as exists in the country, and Will Muschamp mentions that there. But the cool thing about this overture, this pursuit by the Philadelphia Eagles, would let you know that Glenn Schumann is actually about more than that. Now, deep down, we know that Schumann's more than just a recruiter, but if you want some sort of outside validation of the fact that Schumann's value as a football coach is about more than just his ability to collect talent, the Philadelphia Eagles going after him sort of shows you what that's all about. A, Philadelphia loves Georgia. We know this. Uh, what was it that uh, uh, Howie Roseman, the, the, the Eagles GM, said last year after Jordan Davis and the Kobe Dean got drafted? They sort of viewed Georgia as kind of a one-stop shop for all the talent they needed. So, so you know, Roseman, this Eagles organization, has certainly spent plenty of time around Athens, spent plenty of time around UGA. So they're looking deeply at situations like this. And if they're pursuing Glenn Schumann to be their defensive coordinator, even if he's one of the finalists, you know, even if even if he's just one of those guys that kind of was like working his way up the ranks of this interview process and just a guy that was in strong consideration, even if that's all this was. Here's the thing, you know, the Eagles don't give a rip about Glenn Schumann as a recruiter because in the NFL, you don't recruit now, you know, to a certain extent, you do maybe a little bit for free agency. but That's not the name of the game when it comes to the NFL. The name of the game in the NFL is about taking a you know dry erase marker and going on the whiteboard or you know maybe the tablet whatever else and constructing defenses to stop these very good offenses that exist in the NFL. The NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles, do not care if Glenn Schumann is a good recruiter. So if they're pursuing him to be their defensive coordinator, they are pursuing him because they like his on-field coaching abilities. And that's a cool validation here, a cool reminder that when it comes to Schumann's presence at UGA, young coach kind of working his way up the ranks, this is about more than just a guy that's good at acquiring talent. This is also a guy that's really good apparently at developing talent, but also deploying that talent on the field during games. And if you're a UGA fan, another one of those reasons that you I think ought to and probably do feel really good that he's coming back. The other thing here is, as I mentioned, you know, Schumann is kind of a, a little bit of a young guy. He's kind of working his way up the ranks. And in a lot of ways, he looks a little bit like Dan Lanning did before him, right? You know, Schumann's version of turning down the Philadelphia Eagles, or at least removing his name from consideration for the Eagles, is a little bit like Dan Lanning, who flat out rejected Texas prior to the start of the 2021 season to go there and get big bucks, chose to stay at UGA. The result was a national championship, but now Dan Lanning's the head coach at Oregon. Well, guess what? Uh, right now, it sort of looks like the Glenn Schumann 
is sort of on track to potentially do the same kind of thing. He has been a young coach, but as Kirby Smart says, if you're good enough, you're old enough. And no matter how young Schumann has been, he has clearly kind of worked his way into a level of success in the coaching profession that sort of belies his you know, relatively young age compared to some of the guys he sort of does this with. And I say all that to say, imagine how attractive this makes Georgia to other young coaches, that this is not just a program that is about – kind of recycling you know guys have been around the block a little bit you know Mike Bobo is your offensive coordinator now uh Will Muschamp's your other co-defensive coordinator Brian McClendon's back in place as your offensive line coach Stacey Searles is back in place as your offense or I should say McClendon's your wide receivers coach uh Stacey Searles is your offensive line coach these are all guys that got a little bit of tread on the tire you know got a little bit of uh you know time spent in the industry time served but this is not just at Georgia a place where we're going to go back and kind of recycle through some old names and give some guys a chance to sort of do this one more time no Georgia has also proven itself to be quite adept at finding young talent developing that young talent and giving that young talent a chance to be a star I mean isn't that what happened to Dan Lanning like he kind of quickly ran through this program and now he's leaving uh, and leading one of the probably the what the 20 25 best jobs in the entire country over there at Oregon that's what Dan Lanning's getting a chance to do it seems like Glenn Schumann is kind of following a similar path that may be why a rising star like Jader Uzo Deribe wanted to be outside linebackers coach here and why a guy like Fran Brown wanted to be uh, uh you know a cornerbacks coach here you know you look at what's you know going along uh, uh with Trey Scott on the defensive line spot that was a guy that was mentioned pretty prominently for some pretty big time defensive coordinator jobs this year chose to stay at UGA that there is clearly an upward mobility opportunity that exists at Georgia The guys like Schumann are seemingly taking advantage of he's probably not too many years away from being a head coach himself somewhere and that's the kind of thing that's going to want to make other young coaches want to be a part of this program that is another reason to like everything that's going on with Glenn Schumann right now then let me give you one final thing here for a moment and I think this is real, and I think this is something you've got to strongly, strongly consider. It is very hard to be a college football coach right now. We see a lot of attrition of guys who, if they've got other options, and in some cases this is you know, college guys moving on to the NFL, at the lower level of the college ranks, you see some college coaches who've gone back down to high school there too. That right now there is a little bit of the phrase I've used before, a little bit of a brain drain. Good coaches leaving college football for other levels of the sport because of the challenge that exists with college football right now. And at some point in time, this has got to be considered. This has got to be addressed. This has got to be discussed. I, I don't think you want to consistently year after year see a huge number of college coaches leaving your sport because the sport's not going to be better off. If that continues to be the case. But for now, we're just talking about Georgia. The fact that a guy like Glenn Schumann still wants to be in college football at a time in which so many others don't, boy, that says something about Schumann, but it also says something really strong about the coaching culture that Georgia has in place where the guys here are willing to embrace what's hard. The guys here are willing to to be about this. What is the kids like to say? They want that smoke. You know, these, these, these Georgia coaches want that. They want to be a part of that at a time in which not everybody necessarily does. How many... <laughs> How many assistants did Florida lose to the NFL this offseason? Three. And in fact, let me show you this from Brandon Marcello. Uh, Brandon Marcello, tw- writer for 24 7 Sports on Twitter, uh, he put out yesterday uh, that there have been 17, I think the actual number is 19. Uh, Marcello eventually corrected himself. There have been 17, although actually 19, FBS assistant coaches and counting who've left for NFL jobs this offseason. Arizona's hired four, Denver's hired three, New England's hired two, the Panthers have hired two. So there right now is a huge brain drain of college coaches going to the NFL and we don't have to like speculate as to why this is it's hard to be a college coach you got transfer portal you got NIL you got all these things you know tougher schedules on the way expanded playoff along the way you've got a lot of change in college football that's making the job of being a college coach just more difficult than it used to be Glenn Schumann says I don't care I like doing what's hard uh doing what's hard and doing that well makes me well paid because ultimately it's the it's the willingness to and the ability to navigate difficult circumstances that actually create great success for you in life and so Schumann says sign me up for what's hard Kirby Smart says sign me up for what's hard the other eight assistant coaches on this Georgia roster coaching roster say sign me up for doing what's hard that's a really nice thing about Georgia here right now 
They got coaches that want to be in college football at a time in which not everybody wants to be in college football if they have other options. So Glenn Schumann, apparently pursued by the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, maybe one day that's a job that Schumann might take, or maybe one day he might be an NFL coach, or one day he might be a, a college coach somewhere else. But for now, he is staying at Georgia. He is here to run it back, to go for three in 23, as we'll eventually talk about around here. And if you're a Georgia fan, it doesn't take a genius to tell you that is a very good thing. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented today by Engineered Solutions of Georgia, and we are happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today. Live on video, 945 for our first in 15, dognation.com, the Dog Nation app, 10 a.m. after that. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Radio Noon, App and Sports Radio 960, The Ref, and as a podcast, wherever you find them, including the world famous dognation.com, we are just really happy to have you with us today and a big thanks to our friends at engineered solutions of georgia for making all of this possible i love what esog does for our audience and frankly i just love esog you know they're proud partners of uga i think it's always fun to support those that support the dogs they are longtime friends of ours at dog nation daily i love that because i'm thankful for their support but i'm also grateful for the ways in which they've taken care of our audience over the years i just love that i like the peace of mind about being able to recommend a company that I know is going to do good work for you. It makes me feel good. I feel like I'm solving a problem for you, or at least helping solve a problem for you, and I like that. And that's what Engineered Solutions of Georgia is. They are a solutions-based company. They're ready to solve your problem if you're dealing with some sort of issue related to like water being where it's not supposed to be inside your house or foundation trouble. Because let's face it, your home is maybe your most important financial investment, but it's also the source of a lot of your you know, your, your, your memories, and, and it's just where you live your life. And so protecting the structural integrity of your home is really, really important. So you don't want water creeping in. You don't want wet spots in your basement, your crawl space. You don't want that standing water uh, that kind of comes in sometimes when it rains. You want to waterproof your home to kind of keep all that on the outside where it's supposed to be. And when you see those cracks showing up down on like the, you know, concrete floor of your basement maybe or also in the walls, you know, it's time to get that scene about. And and maybe our friends at ESOG can tell you, hey, it's not as actually a big a deal as you might think it is, which is always great news. But if it is something more serious than that, all the better reason to be on the phone with Engineered Solutions of Georgia because they've got a team of engineers on staff. There's nobody else in our market uh, that devotes that level of resource to your problem. So reach out to them today. Foundation issues, waterproofing issues. Give them a call, 678-ESOG now. That is 678-ESOG now, and that'll get you in touch with Engineered Solutions of Georgia. All right, here on our program, I'm going to get in touch with Jake Fromm later on, the former Georgia quarterback. That is always fun. Connor Riley here coming up in a couple of minutes there as well. Prior to that, let's go around the doghouse. And if I could have any conversation with Kirby Smart, and I don't mean like a press conference question because a lot of times that's not you know as in-depth as you'd like to be able to go. If I could have the, the ability to sort of sit and chat and talk with Kirby Smart, I believe this is the subject I'd want to speak to Kirby Smart about if I could really get a minute or two of his time and really kind of get some some actual insight into his thought process this is what I'd like to know from Kirby Smart how much of all of what's happening in college football now did he see coming now let me tell you what I mean by this it has seemed like as of the last few years that college football has been in the midst of a major offensive revolution that that it just sort of seemed like offense was taking over college football was it uh, five six years ago the average points per game for teams across the division one level of college football was in excess of 30 points highest it had ever been as recently as five or six years ago it just sort of seemed like offensive football was taking things over in fact you know it's been within the last few years that we've heard Nick Saban openly embrace the idea that that man you know, it's all about now trying to score as many points as you can it's all about now trying to be you know that kind of team I, I've played audio like this for you before but I want to play it for you again to give you an idea of just how seemingly prevalent this wisdom was uh, over the course of the last couple of years that college football had become an offensive dominated sport throwing the football in particular and the kind of you know running the ball playing defense type stuff of the past had, in the eyes of some, including a guy like Nick Saban, come, become totally passe. In fact, let me let you hear Saban on this as a reminder. This is what he said not all that long ago. The game is different now. People score fast. I grew up with the idea 
that you play good defense, you run the ball, you control vertical field position on special teams, and you're going to win. Whoever rushes the ball the most for the most yards is going to win the game. You're not going to win anything now doing that. All right, because A, the way the spread is, the way the rules are to run RPOs, the way the rules are that you can block downfield and throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage. I mean, those rules have changed college football. All right, and no huddle fastball has changed college football. So I changed my philosophy about five or six years ago. All right, and well, it was more than that when Lane came here. We said we got to outscore him. So as I've told you before, I think the kind of late stage Nick Saban career the winter of Nick Saban's career I think one of the most important kind of I guess narratives of this sort of late stage of Nick Saban's career is I think he bet too big on an idea that turned out to be wrong Nick Saban clearly right there is aggressively embracing the way in which he believes that college football has has dramatically changed and there's no doubt it changed some as we said a moment ago five six years ago uh, teams in college football were averaging 30 points per game across the Division One level. Scoring was clearly really high. But I think that Nick Saban overstated, either in his mind or with his words, how much college football actually changed. And I actually think he even misunderstands some of this with his own program. He mentions bringing in Lane Kiffin and the, the, the willingness to kind of evolve by bringing a guy like Kiffin. But if you really look at it, the national championship they won with Kiffin in 2015 – they had Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry won the Heisman Trophy. He was carrying the ball 40 times per game for them you know, late in that season. In 2017, still with Kiffin still here, they won the national championship. Uh, uh, but you know, you're know, you talking about a situation in which they weren't scoring as many points then as they would in years after that. But around some of this time, you, know, you had the game in 2014 against Ohio State when they lost, giving up 40. You had the game against LSU in 2019. They lost, giving up 40-something points. The game against Clemson in 2018, they lost, giving up 40-something points. You know, <laughs> I, I think that, that Nick Saban just greatly overstated how much the game had evolved, and I think that he probably allowed his program – to evolve and change too much to the point that it kind of lost some of what used to make it special. I believe that's true. And as I said before, if I could talk to Kirby Smart about anything and kind of get some interesting insight from Kirby, I'd love to know from him is how much he was willing to believe that college football wasn't changing as fast and as quickly as someone like Nick Saban thought it was. Because clearly Kirby Smart embraced some change. You bring in Todd Monk and you kind of bring in some air raid concepts. You do some things different offensively. But Kirby Smart never allowed his program to kind of change as much as other programs such as Alabama were. And I think that Kirby clearly benefited from that. In fact, we now have more statistical proof of just how true that really is. Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports, uh, wrote a column a few days ago about the fact that now for the second consecutive year, scoring is actually down in college football. And this is the first time since, I believe, 04-05. 2004 2005 that we've had consecutive seasons of less scoring than the year before and this is a little bit ponderous and complicated but i want to try to read this to you this is dennis dobbin cbs sports so he says last season when he says last season he actually means 2021 so let me just say 2021 he says 2021 was the lowest scoring season in fbs in 11 years per ncaa statistics that was a trend that also continued in 2022 the average of 28.38 points per uh, team was not only down for the second straight year but it was the lowest average since the 2011 season when teams averaged 28.29 uh, points per game. Once again, that's Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports. So what he's saying there is, is that we've had year over year, 2021 and 2022, with less scoring than the year before. And this year, per team, per game, the overall total scoring was lower than it's been in college football since 2011. That is statistical proof that what Nick Saban said a couple of years ago was just flat out wrong. And Kirby Smart's a little bit slower, a little bit more deliberate embrace of some of these changes in college football. It actually looks really smart. So no pun intended. So the question here is, well, did Kirby just get lucky? You know, <laughs> what was his slow change? Just one of those things where he sort of lucked into uh, a trend that kind of reversed itself? Or was he aware of this at all, you know, the, the whole time? that the aggressive embrace of offensive football, the aggressive embrace of what I would describe as a little bit more finesse-oriented, that was kind of a fad, I guess maybe uh, the best way to say that, or at least maybe if not quite a fad, how about cyclical? That it was a little bit of a cycle and things 
maybe led by Georgia. Certainly, uh, certainly, you know, Georgia has taken advantage of this. The cycle's kind of worked back in the direction of, hey, no, it actually still is really good to play defense. And it actually still really is good to be able to control the line of scrimmage with running the football. And having the best quarterback and scoring the most points, that doesn't always work at the college football playoff level because a team like Alabama lost two games this year and a team like Ohio State hasn't won a national championship since 2014. I think mean, that's really interesting. That if I could talk to Kirby about anything, that's one of those things I'd like to know more about because pretty clearly he was moving in the opposite direction of a prevailing trend, and that has worked out really well for him and the teams that really embraced that trend that was so strong and so prevalent a few years ago. All of a sudden, now that, hasn't, not, that has not quite worked out quite so well for them. So that is around the doghouse here today. Interesting data from Dennis Dodd scoring down. And obviously, Georgia, the best defensive team in college football, reigning as the two-time national champion. If you're a dog fan, you love all of that. So before we're done here today on the program, we are going to talk to Jake Fromm. We'll get you know plenty of fun stuff with him, have a great conversation about everything going on around uh, uh, UGA and you know kind of the, 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 the really cool stuff with him. But for now, we also want to get into everything uh, uh, around Georgia there as well with a guy who's written some great stuff here at DogNation.com the last couple of days, including what does it mean that Glenn Schumann's coming back to UGA? Let's talk about more about all of that right now as we welcome in Connor Riley here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So, Connor Riley, we got some interesting news yesterday. First of all, it's great to be talking to you again after uh, me being away here for a little while. But uh, we got some interesting news yesterday. Uh, Glenn Schumann, as Chris Lowe reported, interview for the Philadelphia Eagles. There had been some chatter about that, removing his name from consideration. He's coming back to Georgia. I think it's just obviously objectively good news for UGA. But uh, what do you make of all of this, the, the potential connection for Schumann, an NFL job, the fact that he's coming back? What does all this mean to you? Yeah, uh, I'm not surprised an NFL team would look at Schumann. Uh, I think with the way the college game is going, uh, to some coaches that is a more attractive lifestyle. And Glenn Schumann does have two young kids, and so you can understand him wanting to potentially be around his family more. But I never much seriously considered the fact that he would leave the University of Georgia. It seems like he wants to be a college coach. Uh, he excels at the recruiting aspect of this in a way very few coaches in, in America do at this point in time. And you look at the track that he's on, I think he's going to be an SEC head coach within the next three, four, five years. Yeah. Uh, and staying as a defensive coordinator at Georgia is the best way, I think, at this point in time to continue on that track. And so, you know, Georgia obviously is better off with him around. He's been one of the more important figures in this program. There's a reason he's one of two remaining first assistant hires still on the staff from when Kirby built his first staff back in 2016. And to see the growth that he's made as a, as a position coach and now as a co-defensive coordinator with the play caller this past year, doing all this at the age of 32, which is just seemingly rather insane given, you know, you see some other coaches in the, in the past that they take for him to make the rise to the age at which he has, I think speaks to why he still has such a very bright future in Georgia's very much better off the fact that he is spending it there at Georgia. And one of the things I said before you joined us is we all know how good of a recruiter Glenn Schumann is, but the Eagles don't care about that. They don't, you know, you know, that's not interesting to them at all. So the fact that they might be pursuing him as defensive coordinator is to me also kind of an affirmation of how good of an on-field coach he is too, which we probably believe to be true. But if you want some sort of outside, uh, outside the program kind of validation of that, the fact that Philadelphia seemingly had come calling on him or was at least kicking the tires on Glenn Schumann kind of serves as a reminder to Georgia fans that, that Schumann's value to UGA is about more than just his ability to acquire talent. Right. I mean, every linebacker that has started for Glenn Schumann has gone on to play in the NFL. You know, not just Roquan Smith, but Monty Rice, Tate Crowder, and Kobe Dean is going to play a much bigger role for the Eagles next year. Um, you, you look at the track record. Even you can look at the college record right now. Fresno Marshall, who transferred from Georgia because he couldn't be out, Schmel Munden and Jamon Dumas Johnson, two very talented linebackers, is going to Alabama for more playing time, which five years ago, or maybe even three years ago, uh, would have been a preposterous statement. But uh, it speaks to the level of development he has with those linebackers in his room and how well respected of a coach he is to where, you know, Tresman Marshall, a really talented linebacker who couldn't get on the field the manner in which he wanted to at Georgia 
going to Alabama for more playing time. And I'll say one more thing about this, and we'll move on and talk about something uh, different. You also kind of touched on something a minute ago that, that I addressed, which is that I think in the age of 2023 with, you know, the huge number, I think the total was 19, you know, college assistants that moved on to the NFL here over the course of this offseason, the idea that a guy like Glenn Schumann really wants to be in college football, I think that's valuable for UGA. Now, uh, eventually the clock is ticking here, and he's going to probably go on and be a head coach somewhere else, like you said. But for now, Georgia's got assistants who – want to be in college football and right now that's a pretty valuable thing because it seems like a lot of people with options are choosing to go somewhere else for you know very obvious reasons but I don't take it as insignificant that you got a collection of assistants at, at Georgia a, a head coach at Georgia there as well who really still like being in college football even though the job of being a college coach has seemingly gotten a lot harder yeah and, and I, I think that helps explain the hiring of Mike Bobo a bit too in that you know Yes, Todd Munkin, I, I think no one was surprised that he'd eventually one day end up going back to the NFL. Mike Bobo wants to be at Georgia. He wants, this is a job for him that I think he's going to be at for a while, for the long haul. And you look at some of the other assistants on this Georgia staff now, you know, Todd Hartley is entering, what, I believe his fifth season here coming up. Uh, Del McGee has been also on the staff since 2016. Uh, Stacey Serrell is, is someone who's going to be here for the long haul. You have guys on this on this staff now, Trey Scott as well, uh, entering his seventh year in this program. You have guys that not just want to be in college, as you correctly point out, but very specifically want to or have been at Georgia for a long time. And yes, it helps that Georgia is one of, in this case, occurring situation, the best school in the country for that. But these are guys that have been at Georgia for a long time and have put in the work to help get Georgia to where it is in the college football ecosystem. And now that they're reaping the benefits, you're only leaving this job if it's going to be for a head coaching or a clear, obvious upgrade. And in some cases, these guys don't necessarily see the NFL as an upgrade for that over what they want to do and what they have at the University of Georgia right now. So you follow the NFL draft more closely than I do. I believe it's one of your favorite things. I like to watch the draft on TV, but certainly the pre-draft process is not one of my favorite things, not even by a long shot. But I'm curious to sort of see how you're kind of formulating your viewpoint uh, about the draft right now, especially as it relates to Georgia. Here's the best that I can tell what's going on. I do think this is going to be really fun heading towards the spring. It seems like, Connor, we've got a lot of swing prospects among the ranks of, of, of former dogs here. You know, Nolan Smith could be a first-round pick. Maybe he's not. Uh, Keely Ringo could be a first-round pick. Maybe he's not. I'd say that Darnell Washington's going to be a little bit like that, you know, there as well, where, hey, you've got some high-end projections on these guys that look really, really good. And if you're a Georgia fan, you're probably rooting for that to happen just because you want kind of a nice, happy ending to these college careers. On the other hand, you know, maybe it doesn't quite work out for all these guys. I think it creates great drama either way. I think it's really fun to consider the number of guys for Georgia that could be first-round picks. Obviously, as a partisan here, I'm rooting for all of them to be. Uh, and that's, to me, what's going to be fun about the next few weeks is seeing how many of these guys do sort of perform their way into the first round or allow their tape to sort of speak for them and, and, and kind of you know uh, confirm them as first-round picks. That, see, that, that, to me, seems kind of fun here over the course of the next few weeks. Yeah, I think everyone feels pretty comfortable knowing that Jalen Carter and Broderick Jones are going to be first-round picks. And then from there, this week in particular with the NFL Combine, you know, Nolan Smith, I don't expect him to work out, uh, though he may be far along enough in his rehab and recovery from his torn pectoral injury that he's able to do so at the Combine. Um, I think when he gets in front of NFL teams, he's really, really going to impress them with just his football character, his intelligence, what he's going to bring to the table, and I think that's going to help propel him potentially into the back half of that first round there. But he's not going to be a scheme fit for everybody with his size and measurables, but uh, you and I have spoken time and time again about him, about the role and how important he was to this Georgia team. And with the teams picking at the end of the first round, those are guys usually they're looking for guys that can come in and help put them over the top competing for a championship. Nolan Smith absolutely has that in his DNA. And I think, you know, you look at a team like, say, the, the Philadelphia Eagles or the Kansas City Chiefs there at the very end of round one, the two teams that just played the most recent Super Bowl. I think Nolan Smith fits characterized with what they're looking for. As far as the guys that are working out this week, uh, Keely Ringo, Darnell Washington, and Stetson Bennett, in my opinion, are the three that have the most to gain or the most to show scouts at this NFL Combine. Uh, we'll start with Ringo. Uh, it seems pretty clear that the NFL draft community, I would say, is down on Ringo, uh, and it sort of matches the tenor and tone that I think a lot of Georgia fans 
had taken with Ringo and his play during the 2022 season. Look, Keita Ringo is going to be one of, if not the best testers at this event. I expect him to fly in the 40-yard dash. I expect him probably to even test better than some people might think in the short shuttle drill because he is that elite of an athlete and has been training for this. And I thought yesterday on your show you made a really great point about Keely Ringo sort of being famous and sort of the trappings that came with that for him this past year. In the time I've spent getting to know Keeley and the time I've spent covering Keeley, look, he might not be Deion Sanders. He might not be Darrell Revis. But he does all the little things that you love, that, that a football coach loves so well. He's going to be a successful football player at the next level. And when you factor that in with his athleticism and what he's going to bring from the table there, the fact that he's able to make it at Georgia, the fact that he's playing special teams at Georgia to get onto the field, I believe, in my opinion, that's enough to merit being a first-round pick. We'll see if NFL teams agree with me. It's a very deep cornerback class, and you can sort of pick and choose what you like in a number of different prospects there. But I think with Keeley, he just does the little things so well in a championship level. I get, you know, he might lose the ball in coverage sometimes. It's literally every defensive back coach has told me. That just sort of happens when you're playing the position. And so I think Keeley... You know, there's some interest to see how he goes out and tests. I think he's going to be a top 1% tester this week, and I think that's going to launch an even further conversation about him and his draft prospects as far as where he's going and where he ultimately ends up. On Jalen Carter, obviously there's a lot of interest right now, and, you know, we don't really know what Chicago's going to do with that number one pick. Maybe they're trading it. But one of the things I like to do is sort of compare guys across draft classes. I don't really feel like we do that enough year to year. How special of a prospect do you think that Jalen Carter is? I mean – you know, compare him to a Quinnen Williams, compare him to some of these guys that have come out in recent years. Is this a game-wrecking player at the NFL level in your mind? Uh, yeah, Daniel Jeremiah uh, said he likes Carter more than Quinnen Williams. And Quinnen Williams was the number three overall pick in the 2019 NFL draft by the Jets, and he had a lot more production coming out of Alabama that year than Jalen Carter did. Uh, Carter, I believe, finished his career with five and a half sacks. One of my favorite stats in sort of reading up and writing and reporting on him as a freshman, and he played a good amount as a freshman, yeah. he had more touchdown catches than sacks that season. <laughs> uh, and, and that just sort of speaks to the freaky athleticism that he has and what he's able to do. Uh, you know, look, Aaron Donald is literally the gold standard when it comes to defensive tackles uh, in really essentially my entire lifetime at this point in time. Uh, and quite frankly, he might be the best defensive football player of my lifetime in terms of NFL and what they've done. He is that level of good. And Aaron Donald fell a little bit in the draft because he was only six foot one. Jalen Carter has none of those concerns in terms of height. And look, expectations are going to be really high for him. They're really high for him at Georgia this past year. And as stunning as this is, because I think we all knew coming into the season, he was very certainly, you know, talent wise, 1A or 1B best player in college football on the defensive side of the ball, along with Will Anderson. And I kind of think if you ask most Georgia fans, they would they would tell you that Carter exceeded the expectations that were placed on him at the beginning of this year. And I know he dealt with knee and ankle injuries in the first half of the season, but from the Florida game through the LSU game, I think that six-game stretch, I struggle to recall a defensive player playing at a more dominant level consistently week in, week out than Carter did over that stretch. And even, you know, you look at that Ohio State game, I know he didn't come up with a sack in that game, but he was still – getting to the quarterback, forcing pressure, played, I think, 53 snaps, which is an absurd amount for someone on that Georgia defensive line, especially given how much they rotate. And so I I think with Carter, I think generational prospect is thrown around a little too much from time to time. He is just that good, and it would not surprise me in the slightest if when he does get to the NFL, he once again continues to live up to the hype. I want to squeeze in one more topic before we let you go. You got a piece of a dognation.com about replacing some of these guys on offense that are on their way to the NFL. I also talked a little bit about that last week. And a couple of things I want to hit with you here, Connor. First of all, there's this is that, you know, I kind of talked last week about the premise of, hey, Georgia fans a year ago had to hear so much about, oh, how do you replace this guy? How do you replace that guy? A lot of that was on defense. And because of the fact that Georgia emphatically won the national championship, completely, you know, eradicated that as a topic, that the the overall thought is you won't really hear much about that going into 2023 Georgia's sort of proven it can replace talent and yet when you make a list of the guys that are not going to be here anymore it's actually almost a little bit of a longer list than you kind of expected it to be just given the important contributions that some guys made in some cases leadership in many cases on field performance do you kind of think that there's a chance that 
that replacing some of what Georgia lost off 2022 is actually now a little bit of an underrated topic, given the fact that we heard so much about, about that before last year? Yeah, it, it, and Kirby Smart had, uh, spoke about it after the national championship game, which sort of leads us to know that this is already the way he is thinking. Like, Dar- like Oscar Delp is a really, really good player. I, I think he's going to be an important player for this program, not just in this coming season, but beyond that. As good as he is, and I want to stress this again, this is not a knock on Oscar Delp. Oscar Delp's a really good player. But you don't replace what Darnell Washington does. Darnell Washington is not as special as a player if he's as easily replaceable as what he brought to the team last year. Georgia's offense without Darnell Washington is just going to look fundamentally different because there isn't another six foot seven, 280-pound tight end that can play offensive tackle lining up for you at tight end this year. Uh, Kyrus Jackson is a guy who... Uh, I think a lot of people are overlooking. That guy did everything for Georgia. He was a special team superstar. Uh, incredible leader, incredibly well-respected voice in that locker room. Uh, you look at the wide receiver room, Marcus Rosemary Jackson can do some of those things, but from an all-around aspect, there's no real replacing of what Kiaris brought in terms of intangible qualities to this team this past season. I know you and I touched on Roger Jones a week ago. Yeah, That guy was awesome last season. And, and while, yes, Amarius Mims has a really high ceiling and they have a lot of bodies that can throw at filling in at the, the left tackle spot, I, I don't know how people properly understand just how dominant Roger Jones was, especially at the end of last season, in terms of both the run game and the pass game and what he was able to do there. And, and so, yes, we understand that George is going to have the bodies and the talent and the ability to, to replace that, but as you point out, it has now somewhat – Things so far the other way that it has become a little underrated in terms of the things that the guys that are going to the NFL Combine, some of these guys who are going to be first round picks, uh, it's going to be difficult to replace them. And even you know adding to this, you know you saw Nolan Smith go down, and Georgia was still able to overcome that and, and replace in somewhat what he brought to the team last season. But like outside linebackers, probably the biggest question mark on the team at this point in time, other than quarterback. And you probably feel a little bit better about the quarterback situation than you do at outside linebacker, given other than Chad Chandler, you have no idea what you have at that position, especially with Marvin Jones Jr. not playing this spring. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they ultimately go about not just replacing these guys, but reshaping the team without some of these guys out there. Yeah, just very quick as a follow-up on that. Uh, you know, Broderick Jones is the one that I keep kind of coming back to because, Connor, everything I read about him pre-draft is he is a very – kind of bulletproof prospect a little bit people really really like Broderick Jones which I'm glad they do but if the NFL draft scouts like him that much that means my team got a lot of value out of him over the course of this last year and it's kind of quiet in some respects but when you hear draft scouts praising him this much it's a little bit of a reminder of oh gosh even with a guy like Amarius Mims who may be one of the best players in the country oh gosh that's just really hard to replace a guy that that is that well received by the draft community right now. I think this is where you know Jones really being a only start a one year full starter. I, I think overskews just how important he was. And yes, obviously he came into the national championship game, and I think truly helped swing that game there. But you know, it, Jones is the type of guy who has the talent of being a, a multi year. You know, you think thirty game, thirty plus game starter. When in reality, if he only started twenty nine games in his time at Georgia, and so that maybe I think a little bit leads us to believe that, oh, you know, he wasn't some superstar offensive tackle. He was absolutely that good. And, and, you know, I've talked about this before. And going back and watching games from last season, just seeing Ryder Jones annihilate people in the run game has quietly become one of my favorite things in rewatching this offense from last season. And I don't know if there's a guy on this team that can replace that. And I would include Amarius Mims in that there as well. I just think they're a little bit different players in that regard at this point in time. And so who's going to take up that attitude, that mentality, that, that fire that Broderick Jones played with? It's going to be really interesting to see how Georgia, even though they bring back a ton on that offensive line, it's going to be interesting to see how they replace that. Connor, that's well said and good stuff. We look forward to reading plenty more from you at dognation.com. And, of course, we will talk to you back here again next week as well. Yeah, as always, it was a pleasure. One thing I do want to wish a happy birthday to Devin Willick. Today would have been his mm. 21st birthday. Kirby Smart out a really, I think, emotional and great statement on him and – you know, anyone who's dealt with grief knows that birthdays of people who have passed away can be tough. So mm. thinking of the Willick family today and, and all that goes along with that. That's well said, Connor. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yep. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, you know, we said this at the time that in life, you know, you got 
the challenge of trying to process multiple things at the same time and things that make you feel very, very differently. And, you know, there is a natural enthusiasm we have about college football. And there's a natural excitement we have about Georgia getting back to the business of a 2023 season and all that's potentially at stake here. And we just love college football. We just love it. We just love being around it. We love the college football calendar. We love the the excitement of spring practice. And, and, and we just love all of that. And yet concurrent to that, you know, Georgia is still in the aftermath of a, just a terrible tragedy. And it is not easy for the human brain to kind of navigate both those things at the same time. But it's kind of the clumsy challenge that we all sort of face here. So uh, I'll be sure to check out what Kirby put on social media. I'm glad that Connor brought that up. And, you know, we continue to be deep in prayer. Uh, and I mean that sincerely for everybody at Georgia who is trying to, to figure out how to just sort of operate in the aftermath of what obviously – was a just a horrible horrible situation so uh, i'm glad that connor uh brought that up and with that said we'll kind of awkwardly transition here we'll talk to jake Fromm here in a minute i'm looking forward to doing that i also want to remind you that we're cruising around the sec courtesy of royal caribbean of course a lot of you know i am still kind of fresh off the uh the aftermath of my own royal caribbean cruise vacation just got back from wonder of the seas a uh, week-long trip there we went to four wonderful ports uh perfect day coco k nasa on the bahamas we we're in falmouth in jamaica and labity which is kind of a private destination there in haiti and you know it was just so amazing uh, you know one of the things that like my son and i did you know we get the snorkeling gear we get out there we're sn- snorkeling in the ocean and at one point in time he's like can you believe we're just snorkeling right here in the bahamas or in haiti wherever it was we we're doing that yeah it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a nice thing and it was a great time for us to sort of bond together and have that fun together we also got the uh water uh, uh park experience there what they call the thrill side of perfect day coco k we're in the uh, wave pool and you know, the water slides and it's just so much fun just to kind of be a part of that. I am just so glad we got that experience. And I think that you, if you can get a chance to be on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship coming up here in 2023 or as we head towards 2024, uh, obviously it'd be a great decision for you to do that. And one of those things that I just think you'd be so glad you got a chance to share that with those that you love. So Jessica Slater, who's a terrific travel agent, you can give her a call 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can talk to her about the entire range of opportunities you have on board with royal caribbean or you can go to royaldogs.com and find out specifically about the dog nation cruise coming up uh in april in fact i think there's still some chance for you to get on board on that if you want to we're getting late on that i'm not gonna lie to you but you might still be able to do that so check out royaldogs.com if you want more on that let me do a couple of things here real quick before we bring on jake from so florida has now announced its replacement defensive coordinator it's austin armstrong armstrong had been dc at uh, southern miss Hired his linebackers coach at Alabama, but not gonna, you know, he ends up not really working there. You know, he, he hired by Alabama, but very quickly going on to Florida. He's very young. I think he's 29 years old, something like that. Very, very young guy here. And look, I totally am willing to acknowledge that a guy like this, Tad, would be linebackers coach at Alabama, a guy who at one point in time was even a quality control analyst here at Georgia. This is very likely a rising star in the coaching ranks. And some of the stuff we say about Georgia assistant coaches maybe could also be true for Austin Armstrong there as well. There is a chance that Florida has made a good coaching hire in the fact that Armstrong's a good coach. But man, oh man, he sure is young. And, you know, this is not Glenn Schumann learning from Kirby Smart, sitting at the learning tree with Smart. You know, Napier's, you know, offensive, or I should say his coaching background is really more on offense that, that, if you're a, if you're a Billy Napier, you bring in a guy you know to run your defense and sort of handles that side of the ball. In the case of Armstrong right now, you're you're trusting a very young guy to do that. This is this is quite an on the job learning experiment here, and it's it's almost a little bit like you know when uh, Buster Faulkner left Southern Miss, like he came to Georgia. And he was a quality control analyst. You know, you know he 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 learned from Todd Monk and he worked with. You know, Mike Bobo this past year, he was around guys who had a lot of coaching experience. Now he's going to be the offensive coordinator at Georgia Tech. And he may be better positioned for success because of the time that he spent here at UG. Who knows? Maybe one of these days he cycles back around to Georgia in some form or some fashion. But but probably better off as a coach because of that experience. On the flip side here, Armstrong goes from D.C. at Southern Miss, the same job on the opposite side of the ball that Faulkner once had, now being D.C. at Florida. You know, if you're a Florida fan, you hope he's ready for this. But as I said yesterday, the real issue kind of becomes here the fact that for Florida, there is just not much to show for Billy Napier's first year. You know, kind of completely sort of um, uh, 
you know, rebooting coaching staff, you lose a bunch of guys to the Arizona Cardinals in particular, uh, you know, a bunch of guys to the NFL, and you're having to sort of start over again with coaching staff. It just sort of seems like that first year for Napier at Florida, not a ton to show for that. Back-to-back losing records in the SEC. Of course, Napier was responsible for the first of those, but he was responsible for the most recent. And here all of a sudden now, what is a very pivotal year for Napier, but a pivotal year for Florida, you know, you know this passing of time becomes a little bit of an issue. The longer you go without being – good without being elite the more people have no memory of that whatsoever that's Florida's issue right now and as a way of correcting some really big defensive problems from a year ago they're going to be turning to a very very young coach trying to get that done tricky situation in Florida I was going to do something on SEC teams starting spring practice Uh, Auburn began yesterday Missouri actually starts today there's a very interesting situation in Missouri with Sam Horn who many of you remember was the quarterback for the Collins Hill team that won state championship a couple years ago in the highest classification um horn is also a baseball player and got hurt playing baseball and it was really kind of awkward to hear eli drinkwitz who actually right now just needs quarterbacks in spring practice um talking about the injury that horn suffered playing baseball that's that's kind of a tricky situation there in missouri we'll talk more about that in the days to come for now though let's get ready to shift gears and do a kroger fresh take as we bring on the former george quarterback jake Fromm here on dog nation daily here today jake we appreciate your time we hope you're doing well it's good to be able to talk to you again and uh welcome back to the show Brian, what's going on? Happy to be here. If you don't mind, before we get into some of the stuff with Georgia, I want to talk about your situation here for a moment. A lot of change with the Washington Commanders as of late. Eric Bieniemy coming in as offensive coordinator. Carson Wentz released uh, here this week there as well. Uh, what does that, if you don't mind me just asking a personal question, what does that mean for you here as you uh, try to work your way up the ranks there in that uh, quarterback room? A lot of change there for the Commanders. Yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, to be quite honest with you, uh, have no idea. Uh, that's just part of the NFL offseason. A lot of change happens because it's a uh, it's a win now league. Uh, but uh, as far as myself, I'm on a futures contract going in uh, to the spring and into the fall. So um, you know, I I believe they keep me around. Hope they keep me around. And uh, man, I, I love and enjoy playing there. And I uh, look forward to meeting the new staff. So that's one of those things. And my personality is not like this. Of course, I'm not an athlete either. But if you are an athlete, I guess you sort of have to be on. You have, kind of be, have to be comfortable with this, right? Of like, there is a lot of uncertainty. You know, coaches yep. are changing year after year. The guys you're playing with and you're around, they're kind of coming in, going out. You really don't know what the future holds for yourself or anybody else. And you just sort of have to be okay with that, which is not necessarily easy for a lot of us to do necessarily. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right, man. You got to be comfortable in the chaos, um, and this happens, you know, for every kind of team uh, in the off season. I mean, teams are trying to make improvements. Guys are moving up ladders, moving down ladders. Guys get fired, so that's just part of football, man. It, it, because it's just it's so important to so many people, um, and you know, everybody wants to win, right? So they're going to do whatever uh, they think is uh, just it gives them the best chances to win. This kind of part of it. It was announced yesterday that Glenn Schumann is or reported, I should say. It was reported yesterday that Glenn Schumann is coming back to Georgia after a little bit of uh, interest maybe from the Philadelphia Eagles. He had interviewed for their defensive coordinator job. When you were at Georgia, Schumann was just getting his college coaching career started. Obviously, you were an offensive guy and he was a defensive guy. But, you know, what was it that you saw that made Schumann special? And what was, was it you saw from Glenn Schumann that kind of has made him, you know, he's defensive coordinator now, George, co-defensive coordinator. He's getting interest from other places. He may be a head coach sometime in the future what did you notice about Schumann back then when he was just getting going as a coach that has now made him so sought after now yeah I, I love coach Shu. I've always loved coach Shu. um and one thing I always noticed from him is just, he was just always really connected uh with players and with his guys I mean man if you talk to anybody in that that linebacker's room I mean they just run through an absolute brick wall uh for coach Shu. so uh, man he really developed the relationships with those guys and then Man, he's been in the system. He knows this system in and out. Um, I'm pretty sure he probably reads it backwards in his sleep. I mean, that's just how well he knows uh, this system and this scheme and, and knows the game of football. So, I mean, when you kind of have those two things um, where guys love you, players love you, want to play for you, and you're really smart, I mean, I think you've got a chance to be a really good coach. I'm curious about this. How much interaction as an offensive player, quarterback in particular, are you having with defensive coaches on kind of a day-in, day-out basis? Are they your enemy because they're trying to stop you in practice? Or are you learning <laughs> things from them because you're trying to stop defense and they obviously you know, know defense? How much camaraderie interaction are you having with those defensive coaches on a uh, kind of a week-in, week-out basis when you're playing quarterback in a place like Georgia? Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely all-of-the-above kind of answer here, depending on the time of year. 
uh, during training camp. Uh, you were 100% enemies trying to beat their brains out every single day. is competitive, um, and you're not trying to give each other anything, right? Um, but th- during the other parts of the year, um, man, you're really just trying to learn from one another. Hey, you guys showed this. What are y'all's rules for this? Why are y'all doing this? Um, and especially throughout the season, too, just trying to help each other out. Because it's all about, man, winning as a football team. Uh, but uh, definitely having those fun during spring practice and during training camps really fun and, and really good competition. So the other week you were on the air with us live when we learned that uh, Todd Munkin was le- leaving Georgia. We were speculating at the time that Mike Bubba would be the offensive coordinator, and now we know that for sure. You've had a couple more weeks to kind of think about this and obviously – you know, uh, process what this might mean for Georgia. So now that it's official, now that Bobo is the offensive coordinator here at UGA, you had kind of stepped up and said you thought he should have gotten the job even prior to him getting it. Well, now that you know that he is getting it, any additional thoughts on kind of what this means for the Georgia offense? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just excited for Coach Bobo. Kind of for him to be able to come back, for him and for his family, uh, it's fun times too. So I'm excited to see what they do. I think they're going to kind of um, – keep this kind of same system, same wordage um, that they've been using under Coach Munkin, and I think they're going to kind of grow off of it and maybe uh, develop a new style under Coach Bobo. So uh, I'm excited to see. I think everybody in the whole state of Georgia and Dog Nation as well are, are man, what, what is this offense going to look like and who's going to be taking snaps and throwing the football for us? So, uh, man, there's a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, and I think we'll get some more as uh, as soon as uh, spring ball approaches. Do you think the change at coordinator changes the quarterback competition at all, one way or another? Hmm, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I really don't don't know, and I don't think so. Um, the way Coach Smart's always done it, he's just always been super competition based, um, and it's just to go. You know, he, he he loves the morale with the guys. How do, how does the quarterback connect with the guys? Who do the guys are looking to to lead them? Uh, and kind of motivate them, and then how? how I mean, I, I mean, how's the guy practice? I mean, does he get the job done? So, um, I mean, Coach Smart's pretty pretty clear cut on that and how he evaluates quarterbacks. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it does, and uh, I know Coach Bobo is going to be pretty tough on those guys. So. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be fun to watch during the spring. I got one more thing I want to ask you before that. Let me remind folks, this is our Kroger Fresh Take with Jake Fromm here on Dog Nation Daily. And by the way, Kroger's got a great opportunity for you right now. You can go digital and save even more than you've come to expect from our friends at Kroger when you create an account on the Kroger app or on the website, and you can get big, exclusive digital coupons just for doing so. So go to Kroger.com slash sign up. That's Kroger.com slash sign up for more information on that. All right, Jake, I want to finish with this. I was talking about this a moment ago with one of our other guests, Connor Riley, that, you know, a year ago, and you're obviously busy with your own football you know, career, so I don't even know how much pay, uh, attention you're paying to this, but a year ago, Georgia faced so many questions about, oh, how do you replace five first-round picks on defense and 15 total NFL draft picks, and there was this kind of assumption out there that Georgia may have lost too much to come back and win the national championship again. Well, obviously, Georgia proved that to be incorrect. They did win the national championship, and all of a sudden now, you're left to assume, well, Georgia won't have to hear that anymore about what you replaced and what you lost off the uh, previous year's team. And yet the other day, I'm kind of making a list in my mind or you know, even on paper of what Georgia does have to replace. And i got to tell you something. As a Georgia fan, as someone who wants Georgia to win, that list actually ended up being pretty long of guys that were on this past team that did a lot of big things for UGA who are not going to be here anymore, almost to the point where I almost feel like it's kind of an underrated topic now of, man, you know, you look at, you know, Guys like Broderick Jones and Warren McClendon off your offensive line. You know, obviously guys like Jalen Carter, Keely Ringo, Nolan Smith off defense. That the list of guys that Georgia still has to replace off this team is still pretty long, even though Georgia's shown you they can replace big talent uh, in, in the past. How significant of a challenge do you think this might be for the Dogs this year? You know, I just have to say that's just part of it, part of college football, and part of having a really good program. Um, and Coach Smart. And his team, his staff recruits extremely well, which is why they are in the predicament that they're in uh, as far as having to replace really good guys who go to the NFL. So, um, man, I, I, in saying all this, it's a really good problem to have yeah. when you have guys who are really talented and going to the NFL and having the chance to play the next level. Uh, but, man, there's some really good, really good guys, younger guys uh, on this football team who are just ready to go prove themselves because – They've come to the best team in college football, and they're ready to have that chance, have that opportunity. So I know they're excited about it, uh, and it's just going to be a great chance for them. And then I also want to note, too, uh, I personally believe that uh, the defense from this past year's national championship team gets really underrated 
um, and kind of overlooked because of the success of the year before. Mm. Man, but that defense last year was extremely just good and extremely talented. So, I mean, they, they're capable of doing that. So, um, I personally won't be too worried about it. I love it, Jake. That, go up and play ball. I love it, Jake. Yeah, that's good. Go. That, that sounds good to me. That's good stuff. Hey, we appreciate your time. Thanks for being here for our Kroger Fresh Take. It's always fun to talk to you, Jake, and uh, we will look forward to getting the chance to do that soon. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brandon. Good stuff with Jake from there. And he brings up an interesting point, and I think you'll see this in spring practice, that if you're a good team, and Georgia's obviously the best team, but if you're a good team, you are going to cycle through talent and you're going to create these sort of open opportunities. And the opportunity creates energy and that's kind of what jake was alluding to because you've got young guys who are like hey it's my turn that's what guys like you know you know you look at the linebacker situation from a year ago with nicobe dean moving on quay walker moving on you had guys stepping up and said there hey it's my turn i'm ready to do this or you know you know along the defensive line you know lewis seen moving on the open spaces created the the excitement the energy of the new guy who was like hey watch what i'm all about i'm getting ready to show you what I'm all about. And, you know, Jake says he thought, you know, the 2022 defense playing in the shadow of 2021 might be underrated, which is kind of an interesting point in its own self. But that's what's going to be cool about spring practice is the open spots. And I listen, you know, I, I do think we probably ought to pay a little bit more attention to just how significant the contribution was from players who aren't here. And we're going to hear less about it, but it actually might be just as impactful as as it was a year ago. We probably heard too much about it. But either way, it's, it's still worth your attention. But as Jake said, yeah, but f- for a program like Georgia, deep with talent, you know, rich with, with, with uh, opportunity here, the excitement about being the next guy in line creates kind of its own contagious energy for spring practice. It's kind of fun to think about it that way. I think that Jake did a pretty good job of uh, laying all of that out. That's why we love having him on the program here on Dog Nation Daily each and every week. So as we wrap up Dog Nation Daily presented by ESOG here today, we will do so with a uh, golden shoe. We can probably bring that fight song. There you go. There you go. Uh, we love the fight song. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so Glenn Schumann returns back to Georgia. Our buddy Mad Dog has weighed in on this. Uh, golden shoe going his way there on that, saying, when you're grateful Glenn Schumann's returning to Georgia, and you see the uh, dog fan there kind of paying homage to the Glenn Schumann uh, picture there on the wall. That's uh, pretty funny stuff by Mad Dog. And I think it is pretty strongly reflecting of how Georgia fans feel about Schumann and this entire coaching staff. You know, Kirby Smart said going into last year, he felt like this was the best coaching staff he had ever assembled at Georgia. Obviously, the proof was in the pudding on that. They won the national championship. And so many of those key assistants coming back now to run it back for 2023, you love the idea of that if you're a dog, even if it doesn't mean Todd Munkin anymore. Uh, lousy, stinking Gators, not anywhere near as much continuity for them as we said earlier. How about 242 days from now, uh, Georgia handing them a beat down once again in Jacksonville. That is our Gator Hater Countdown. We appreciate you being here. We'll see you back tomorrow for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that. We went very long on comments yesterday, as you might expect, first time back in the saddle for a while. We cannot go into as much of that today, just simply on the basis of the fact that we got a lot going on in the studio here today. Um, and I got to get out of the way and let some other folks get some stuff done. So I'm going to do that. And uh, that still gives us plenty of time to talk here. We'll do 15, 20 minutes and then get off the air after that. All right. Uh, Sonia Prescott, going back to the picture, says we don't all look that nerdy. Uh, very true, Sonia. Well, you definitely don't look nerdy. Uh, me, maybe so. Uh, uh, but, yes, yeah, Sonia, that's a good point. All right, let's see what else. Eric Devorncy and Ryan Walker talking about the Falcon situation. Mariota out. Um, talking about the draft class from a year ago. Cornelius Hill also mentioning something that Connor mentioned that today would have been Devin Willick's birthday. And uh, you better believe that um, heavy on our hearts, uh, both Devin and Chandler LaCroix remain for all of us, for sure. Um uh, Matt Rukavina says, I'm planning on having a different dog's title shirt every day for my cruise on the lure of the season in a few weeks. Good idea. Good idea, Matt. Glad to have you on board, Royal Caribbean. And uh, showing off that national championship gear, you better believe that's a good thing. 
Eric Ray says every guest we have on should be required to say go dogs. John Stinchcomb's gonna made that his famous sign off for sure. Um let's see what else. Craig Hill says five star recruits have a hard time sitting on the bench, hard to keep them happy. Um so I had two thoughts on that. First of all, you're absolutely right that that if you end up with like too many seniors, too many, you know, guys that have been here for a long time, like the young five stars, that's not a good thing for them. That you really want guys to kind of come in, develop, dominate, move on. And that just kind of keeps the pipeline humming, right? Because because people do want to play early. Um and there is a little bit of a learning curve for everybody. I don't care how good you are, there's a little bit of a learning curve. But you want to kind of come in as a freshman, kind of develop you know, start to sort of contribute, and then you're dominate, dominating as a year three guy, and then you're out. And that's kind of how you keep that pipeline running. So you're absolutely right about that. I also kind of wonder, especially at quarterback, if we're about to see five-star guys get a little bit more patient. I'll tell you why. If NIL is going to be more of a prevalent factor in some recruitments, then could we kind of see the thought of, like, take, like, Nico Imaleva at Tennessee. So you got Joe Milton, who's going to probably start the year as a starter at Tennessee, and Nico, who could come on during the year, who, who knows what. Just use this as a for instance. If Nico really is getting somewhere near the money that you know, had one time been reported on him, isn't he sort of okay whether he plays or not? Like, you know, in other words, you know, you're a five-star guy, and five-star guys kind of always want to be on the field. But if you're getting your money, are you maybe sort of okay just sitting on the bench because at least you're still getting your money? I almost wonder if we'll see less – you know, uh, push for five-star guys, especially a quarterback, to play right away because, hey, if you're paying me, you can use me how you want, which is on the bench or not. Um, I almost wonder if we might see a little bit more patience on the part of especially five-star quarterbacks about not playing because of the fact that they're, you know, they're getting their financial reward. Uh, let's see what else. Um. Patsy Heath Johnson, Barry Watkins, talking about the quarterback situation and who might redshirt. I mean, the one thing that that George is not going to do, they're not going to save anybody just for the purpose of sort of saving the, for the future. To go back to what somebody said before is, you know, guys want to play. And, you know, George is – like the whole idea of like the redshirt thing, that, that's a really valuable thing for like the Wake Forests of the world and places like that where you don't have enough players – and you want to kind of stockpile as many fifth-year guys as you can when you get a chance to do that. In a place like Georgia, it's sort of a you know use them or lose them type of situation. I would imagine quarterback is is very much kind of the same way. Um, Barry Watkins also says when uh, Brock Vandegrift transfers, will Kirby go to the portal for quarterback number three? So here are um, uh, here are two things I would say about that. First of all. I would say be very careful in assuming that any of us know what's going to happen with the quarterback situation. Just just be careful with that. That it's easy to assume this, and it's easy to assume that, and it's easy to assume the third. But assumptions have a way of end up kind of being wrong from time to time. I would just kind of be careful with that, I guess. I mean, the shiny example, and it's almost such an obvious example, you don't want to use it, but Stetson Bennett's the obvious example of that is that we never would have seen that coming, that that quarterback has a way of sort of surprising you. And Bennett at Georgia would not be the only quarterback example for that was true. Mac Jones at Alabama. Of all the quarterbacks that uh, that Alabama has brought in, the guy who I believe had the best single season of any of those is probably Jones. And that is not, you know, certainly pre-Bryce Young, that was definitely true. And that is not something that people would have seen coming when Jones was the second of the two quarterbacks that Alabama signed for that class of 2017. So in the case of what seems like it's obvious to some, but the Georgia quarterback situation, just be really, really careful about what you're sure about because college football has a way of making our certainties seem silly. Um, So I would say that. But let's say that a quarterback does transfer. Would Georgia look for a veteran presence? I think it might. Now, that's tricky, right? Because – the, the, when I think about this, the guy I think about is Gardner Minshew. Like, Gardner Minshew is a very interesting player to me. Uh, you know, he's in the NFL now. But Minshew had been in East Carolina, and he was getting ready to transfer and go to Alabama, and he was content to, like, be third-string quarterback. And he was going to sit the bench, and he was going to go into coaching, and he was going to be, like, their their veteran presence quarterback – 
just contributing to depth. He was going to learn, you know, from from Nick Saban and learn from that coaching staff or whoever the coordinator was in place at the time. And he was just going to kind of end his football career that way. And then lo and behold, he finally changed his mind, went to Washington State with Mike Leach, set NCAA records, and now he's in the NFL. He's making, I would say, pretty good money. He's pretty famous too. Um, the point is, is that finding that veteran guy who wants to be a veteran guy might be a little bit tricky. Um, uh, you know, th- that guy who says, hey, I am willing to kind of be – your presence on the bench, and hey, if something happens, you need me going to the game. I'm ready to do. I'm ready to do that. I mean, obviously, we have our picture of the NFL. You know, uh, like what Chad Henney was doing for uh, the Chiefs this year, or even what I guess Minshew is doing uh, himself. You know, you sort of have that picture of the uh, of the sort of veteran backup. Kind of finding that in college is not necessarily easy, but but Georgia may be in the market to do that. Um, they might be in the market for that. Let me go to DogNation.com, then we'll go to YouTube. Randy Hall says we can't go longer today because I'm getting ready for the next cruise. No, I'm not quite doing that as of yet. Not quite doing that as of yet. Um, uh, Big J4 uh, on the subject of Darius Smith, who I don't think is talked about enough either. Um, like the one thing you love about Smith is, is to me, and obviously he showed you the athleticism on what should have been. If, if, if the kick had been more accurate, it would have probably been a block. You know, Darius going back to the uh, 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 the – we call it the Peach Bowl against Ohio State. So he showed you his athleticism on special teams right there. But also, Darius Smith to me kind of represents a little bit of what I think is a little bit of a sort of a philosophical change for Georgia, in which they wanted to get a little bit bigger with their pass rushers. And I think that Smith kind of represents that. So, look, it's going to be a knockdown drag out for these outside linebackers. I mean, it's about to be a, you know, you're going to have a good competition there. You know, Marvin's not going to go through uh, spring practice, but he's going to be, you know, ready to do it in the summer. you got guys like Damon Wilson coming in. But uh, I would definitely, definitely, definitely keep a very strong eye on Darius Smith Jr. I, I really would. Um, I think that um, that is a – go back and watch some of his track film, and I'm not a track guy. I, I, I don't really know a ton about track at all, but I've seen some of his stuff, and that big guy – <laughs> running way out in front of everybody else is is certainly an attractive uh, video image if you've seen that. So the athleticism, but also the little bit extra size, you know that that good long frame. Uh, yeah, I definitely think he is uh, very, very, um, uh, very, very you know strongly uh, considered here. Randy Hall also mentioned the possibility of him playing star. You know, we've seen a little bit of that. You know, uh, Lorenzo Carter played some star for Georgia. Uh, uh, who else good outside linebackers have played star? You know, we've seen at times Georgia kind of use the 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 athletic long frame outside linebacker as a star occasionally. We've seen some of that. Um uh, Richard D says I spoke yesterday about the Devontae Smith moment in 2017 being the beginning of Bama's fall. What do you think would be the uh, nail in their coffin? I don't think that Saban comes back again if he doesn't make the playoff this year. I, I don't. I, I don't think he has any appetite for coaching at Alabama as a non-playoff team. And if they don't make it this year, that would be 19-20-21-22. That'd be 19-20-21-22. So, so that'd be, what, three times in five years they wouldn't have made it? Because they didn't make it this past year. They won't make it this year. Um is that, am I right about that? Uh, three times in five years, they, would have made, they didn't make it in 2019. They obviously won it in 2020 and made it in 2021. Um, that'd be three times in 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Yeah, three times in five years, they wouldn't have made the playoff. And what's going to happen eventually is, is Alabama fans are going to turn on Nick Saban. I know that seems crazy, but it's going to happen. Um, you know, right now it's like, hey, it's sort of Georgia fans – doing sort of the concern trolling thing. Oh, you know, you know, Saban's getting on up there, guys. Y'all sure, you know, you sure he's still got it? You sure he's still he's sure he's still the right coach for you? You know, there's a little bit of concern trolling on the part of Georgia fans going on here. But if they don't make the playoff this year, it'll be Alabama fans calling for new blood at coach. It just will be. And that's why Nick Saban at one point in time kind of flirted with the Texas job or something like that. You know, Nick Saban's track record of success won't protect him from the same pressure cooker that exists around everybody in the SEC if they are not winning. It just won't. So that to me is the final nail. Is they'll miss the play if they were to miss the playoff, 
the 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 you know sort of unsettled nature of Alabama fans will kind of return, and that might just be enough for Nick Saban. That's uh, just sort of irritating. Um, all right, JC asks, brings up an interesting point. He says, "I want to disagree with you for the first time ever. Our dogs needed that high-powered offense to beat Ohio State. Saban, unfortunately, was right. I don't think you and I disagree as much as you think." Georgia clearly had to embrace some elements of being a high-powered offense, right? You had to clearly embrace some of that. But what made Kirby's, I think, decision-making process different than other coaches is is that they found a way to get better on offense without trading what made them special. And it was the combination of being, you know, basically – top five, top ten on defense, and top five, top ten on offense. Because the teams that kind of became way more imbalanced, like Alabama, like Ohio State, they lost a lot defensively in the process. Now, I can't necessarily explain to you why that took place, but the statistical proof is obvious, is that the more you became kind of a quarterback, wide receiver-driven program, the more you kind of lost it in other places. And I guess the simplest way to say this, there just isn't a free lunch. You know, there just isn't a trade that's all good without some bad. And I think that Nick Saban made too much of a trade. I think he sold his soul a little too much, uh, you know, for the kind of football team that Alabama became. And you're right. When Georgia needed to kind of go toe for toe and show it could win a shootout, they were capable of doing it. But ultimately, over the course of the last 30 games, the defining characteristic of Georgia has been really good on offense and really good on defense. And, uh, finding a way to play complementary football, something that I don't believe that Ohio State has been. They were more complementary this year, but you know, they have not really been a complementary football team, nor do I believe Alabama has been either. Randy Hall, thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. So, JC, if you're still with us, I'm not really sure how long ago this comment came. If you're still with us, would you agree that we actually agree more than, than, than maybe, uh, uh, maybe you might originally thought? BA's listening face also checks in, which is always a funny username to me. I believe that Kirby is building. Uh, we have every uh, offseason asking how we replace this group. This is what we want. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's probably kind of a sign that um, that things are going well, if that's what you're saying. I, I guess my only point is, is that we heard so much about this a year ago, so much about this a year ago. It was probably, I believe, overrated as a talking point. And the reason why I thought it was overrated, and you probably heard me say this at the time, is that we had a decent amount of track record of CFP national champions. The college football playoff had existed since 2014. Prior to the 2022 season, that's that's 2014 through 2021, um, there had only been two instances of CFP national champions not making the next year's playoff. That only happened twice. So, um, you know, the thought I had was, well, Georgia's probably – still somewhat in keeping with what most of the CFP era national champions have been and therefore probably still a very much playoff contender despite losing 15 draft picks. I believe that last year the talk of what Georgia needed to replace was probably slightly overrated. And while I do believe that Georgia's well set up to replace what it lost off the 2022 team, I'm just kind of a contrarian by nature. I'm always zigging when people are zagging and sometimes that's kind of an annoying feature and sometimes it's kind of the right way to be. I am, I am that way just naturally, authentically. I can't help it, it doesn't seem. Um, but if last year we thought that, ooh, you know, maybe, you know, kind of some of this, you know, challenge of replacing what Georgia lost is a little bit overstated, I think now it actually might be slightly understated. And that's, I guess, the only point that I'm uh, making there on that. All right, over here on YouTube. Um. Let's see what's going on over here. (laughs) It always takes me a little while to figure out what the YouTube conversation is even really about. String Gene reminding us that Ohio State's got two national titles in the last 50 years. Uh, Very true. Um, Paul Moon on the subject of Todd Munkin. There's no doubt that uh, uh, that Munkin's a very good coach. Um... Thomas Dyson also said that Kirby and Munkin broke out the money place against Ohio State because they were uh, behind. They knew Arian Smith was an automatic touchdown when it was called. Yeah, I mean, Smith is a is one of those guys that, I mean, if he ever really puts it together for a whole season, like that could be like a I, – I, that could that could be really something to bald. It really could be. 
Uh, Thomas Tyson says having a chameleon coordinator has its benefits. Munkin could have a sling it all day or run it down their throats like we did against Clemson. So without opening up too much of a can of worms, wouldn't you consider Mike Boba to be a little bit of a chameleon coordinator because they were clearly throwing the ball a lot, like, say, circa 2012. But by, like, his last year at Georgia, 2014, they were running the ball about 60% of the time. Um, like, that's a guy that showed you a couple of different sides of that. I mean, no doubt that Todd Munkin was sort of good at calling a lot of different kinds of uh, plays and, and just sort of being good at whatever. But didn't we see a couple of pretty drastically different versions of the Mike Bobo offense during his time at UGA? And isn't that potentially an argument in favor of him? Um, let's see what else. Uh, Spencer Clark, also on the subject of Boss Bailey. Yeah, we think about the visuals, and this framed photo is hanging in the uh, press box at UGA, and it's the 2002 Tennessee game. The Boss Bailey block is one of the <laughs> – if we did <laughs> – we're talking about lots of Mount Rushmores lately. If we did Mount Rushmore of photograph, this actually might be a good one to do. Mount Rushmore of Georgia photographs. The Boss Bailey – blocked field goal from the uh uh Tennessee game in 2002 like it's superhuman he is so high in the air because you know he's not the biggest dude in the world I don't guess he is so high in the air so high in the air first of all Tennessee was also wearing the most hideous uniforms that day the white with the orange stripe going all the way down their uniforms were atrocious and that's the other thing that sort of stands out in that boss Bailey picture Bailey, when I tell you he is skying, it'd be kind of interesting to see the Smith thing from the Rose. I keep saying Rose Bowl. The Smith thing from the Peach Bowl, the Bailey thing from the Tennessee game in 2002 to sort of see whose hand placement might have gotten higher. Boss was so high in the air, so high in the air, um, so high in the air. Uh, <laughs> Paul Moon, very funny, very funny. Uh, Greg Rosenberg says, I, I think this is kind of true. He says, that at least my understanding is this would kind of be true, that Darnell Washington and uh, Kyle Pitts together in an Arthur Smith offense would be pure devastation. I think that's probably right. And, look, uh, my opinions in the NFL are probably not worth, you know, five cents. But I actually think that Kyle Pitts is probably underrated as a player in that, you know, Atlanta has had so little going on. They had nothing at quarterback this year, nothing at quarterback. Go back and look at Pitts' – I almost want to say freshman year because that's the way I talk. If you go back and look at his rookie year, Kyle Pitts actually had a good rookie year for the Falcons. That um, that I do think that Kyle Pitts is a really good player. Um, And it somewhat pains me to say that because he's a former Gator, but he's a Falcon now. Um, I do think it's good that Atlanta has Kyle Pitts. I do. Um, And I do think Arthur Smith is probably a pretty good coach when it comes to working with the tight ends. And so, I, you know, for a team that probably wants to run the football anyway, uh, having a guy like Darnell, uh, I think that could be really nice. Jerry Dogfan asked a really good question. He says, I know that Florida State won a national title after Bobby Bowden uh, retired, but for the most part, they've struggled. What will be like? What will life be like for Bama after Saban? I think it's a really fair question because all you have to do is go back and look at what life was like for Bama prior to Saban. Um, there were some long falls around uh, Tuscaloosa prior to 2007. Uh, you know, you cycle through coaches a lot. Uh, you know, they won the occasional SEC. You know, DeBose won one, at what, 2000? Um, but the sort of Gene Stallings to Nick Saban era, you know, if you watch the Alabama videos, they sort of act like they kind of went from uh, from uh, Stallings to Saban. It didn't quite work out that way. There was some time in between. Uh, so it is at least possible that um, it is at least possible that uh, that Alabama doesn't quite feel like. I mean, look at Duke right now. Uh, Post Coach K, Duke doesn't exactly feel like Duke at the moment. Um, so that's at least possible that Alabama has some of that kind of stuff too. Now, listen, if we're talking about over the course of fifty years. You know, Alabama's going to probably be good more often than not. But if we're talking about over the course of 10 years, anything's possible. So uh, Alabama having a strong regression in the immediate aftermath of Saban leaving, uh, that's quite possible. Especially since, and this is the kind of thing that if you're an Alabama fan, you got to be honest about. 
there is no obvious replacement. There is no obvious replacement for Nick Saban right now. Um, you know, at one point in time, you were talking about Dabo Sweeney. I don't know. I mean, um, I'm not even really sure how an Alabama fan would even feel about that right now. Like, you know, uh, you know, if if Clemson has sort of slipped from its perch of kind of perennial playoff contender, is Dabo even that attractive of a candidate anymore in a place like Alabama? And, you know, uh, the, the sort of knee-jerk response might be to say, well, there are going to be plenty of people who want to be Alabama's football coach. Yeah, in a way that's true, but it's also replacing Nick Saban in Alabama. And that's obviously a tall task. Is that something that even some very good football coaches might want to do? A uh, pretty challenging situation there. So I do think, you know, post, uh, you know, post uh, Saban Alabama could be kind of interesting. John Burrow says, with all the coaching moves, who is being hired moving up to replace Buster Faulkner? With Bobo moving up to offensive coordinator, who fills his former position? I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, and, you know, it could be that the person that's in that spot is just less famous. And I use famous kind of in air quotes here. Uh, Bobo obviously was famous moving into the analyst position. And Faulkner, would, Faulkner getting hired by Georgia got a lot of attention because it wasn't immediately announced what role Faulkner was going to fill. And Georgia had an open offensive coordinator job. So, I think that we got to consider the possibility that we know a lot more about Buster Faulkner than we otherwise might because of the circumstances from when he was hired. In other words, Faulkner was an offensive coordinator, was hired by Georgia. No one knew what role he was going to be in. And so there was this thought of, was Faulkner going to be the offensive coordinator? Um, you know, Or at least going to be on the staff or something like that that his hire got some attention because of the fact that it was it, it happened at a time in which Georgia didn't have an OC in place. And so I think people have kind of always known a little more about Buster because of that. Now, I think he's also probably a pretty good coach. And I, you know, I'll just be curious to see how he performs at Tech. Um, I think that I think it could go well for him. And if it does, then he could be on some, you know, some bigger radars in the future. But there is a chance that Georgia brings somebody in, and we don't. don't I mean, you, know, you look at the uh, uh, look at Eddie Gordon. Eddie Gordon just left Georgia as the offensive line kind of quality control uh, a guy. He's going to be on field coach at UAB. This is a very important figure for Georgia's, uh, you know, Georgia's coaching staff. Very uh, uh, important offensive line recruiter and sort of a big time guy. You know, a lot of our audience sort of knows who he is because a lot of our audience is very, very deep and everything with UGA. But Gordon wasn't that well known, uh, even though he was doing very important work for Georgia. So there's a chance that Georgia just sort of brings on an offensive analyst. He's just not nearly as well known as Faulkner became. And I think a lot of the 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 attention that Faulkner got was due to what was going on at Georgia when he was hired, if that makes any sense. G. Grace, Bamba boy, and I think I agree with G. Grace on this. He says that Sweeney's way of thinking is not good for Bama. It's different in Tuscaloosa. It might be too much pressure for Dabo. I kind of agree with this. I sort of think that – I think I probably think that Dabo is a better coach than some people think he is, but I do kind of agree with G. Grace that you can't come to Alabama and – if you're going to be a coach at a place like Alabama, really anywhere in the SEC, but especially the place like Alabama, which is about as SEC as you get, you can't be turned off to any mechanism for acquiring talent. You know, you don't want to build your entire team around transfers, but you can't be turned off to the idea of taking transfers. And, you know, you may want to be selective with who you recruit, but you got to cast a big net in a place like Alabama. You know, Clemson historically just offers a lot fewer players than a program like Alabama does. But Clemson also gets caught without enough offensive linemen. They get caught a little thin some from time to time, too. And so, you know, it's always a little bit suspicious when these programs offer eight gazillion players, knowing you only sign, you know, in the old days, you can only sign 25. But you have to be very aggressive about acquiring talent at a place like Alabama. And that's not really been what Dabo's thing has been. Um, and I just don't know how well that works at Alabama. And I'm guessing – that that would be a very contentious job interview for him at a place like Alabama because that program understands you got to bring in the dudes. 
And, um, you know, that's not always been Dabo's M.O. And when you got Deshaun Watson at quarterback or Trevor Lawrence at quarterback, everything's fine. But when you don't have those guys at quarterback, all of a sudden there's a much bigger spotlight on what else you don't have. Um, John Burroughs in the subject of Terrence Edwards one day being a coach. Yeah, I think he'd be a great future coach. I hope he gets that chance. I think he'd be great. I do. Um, uh, DMART42 says, you do wonder if he was set up to be the next offense quarter. He means Buster Faulkner, but saw the writing on the wall when Bobo was hired. So I don't know this to be a fact, but I believe this to be true. Y'all, Buster is young. He's young. I mean, if we're going to make a big deal about Florida hiring, you know, Austin Armstrong as defensive coordinator, then we would have to treat Faulkner being hired as Georgia offensive coordinator in a similar fashion. That that um, a couple of years working as OC at Southern Miss is just probably not a substantial enough resume to be offensive coordinator at Georgia. Now, if you go to Southern Miss and you do well, and then you go to Tech and you do well, well, all of a sudden now you're kind of on the radar for some of that kind of stuff. And that's not a slight at Buster. I think that Buster is probably a pretty sharp guy. Um, and I think he's probably a very successful coach. He probably wouldn't be working as an analyst at Georgia if he wasn't, you know, uh, something of a rising star in the coaching ranks. But we can't, on the one side of our mouth, laugh at Florida for hiring 29-year-old Austin Armstrong from Southern Miss if we would have also openly embraced Georgia hiring, still very young, uh, Buster Faulkner, also most recently from Southern Miss, that that a little bit of time working as a quality control analyst at Georgia, plus a little bit of time at, at Southern Miss, that's not nearly the resume that Faulkner could have after even just a couple of years of working at a place like Tech, or you know, a couple of years of working in a place like wherever comes after Georgia Tech. That that being an offensive coordinator, being a play caller is a very specific job, you know, pushing the right buttons during a game. And that's one of those things you just have to have some experience to be able to do that. So um, I just think the thing that if Buster wanted to be the offensive coordinator at Georgia, and you would assume that who wouldn't want to be, I think I think the thinness of his resume on the simple basis, he's just still a young guy. It's kind of the thin nature of his resume may have been the biggest thing going against him there. Um, uh Let's see what else. Let me kind of swing around the uh, various comment sections and we got to go. We've also ended up going longer than I agreed. So I guess the so the, the thing that started the Mariota conversation, I guess the Falcons have released him, which the Mariota thing is so weird because didn't he basically quit on them last year? Like, that's really strange. That's really, really strange. Um Kent Holcomb also on the subject of all three quarterbacks getting some playing time during the year. I'd love to see it. I, I would. Uh, and not just as a way to keep one from transferring because I don't necessarily want to hold anybody hostage. But when you have a quarterback competition with three guys who all have their various talents and they all have things to sort of recommend a- about them, giving them a chance to show what they can do in a game, first of all, wouldn't that make Tennessee Martin? I mean, yo, we got a rough September stretch coming up here. It's Tennessee Martin. It's Ball State. If you were told, instead of playing Ball State, hey, this is the Gunnar Stockton game, or instead of playing Tennessee Martin, hey, this is the Brock Vandergriff game, doesn't that immediately make the game more interesting? I mean, obviously it's not Kirby Smart's job to necessarily keep us entertained. It's his job to build a winning football team. But doesn't it make September way more entertaining? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like that would make me way happier, uh, which is probably not the point of all this, but nonetheless. Um, let's see what else. Alan Hampton says championship caliber coaches are few and far between. Dabo is a Bama boy and a proven championship coach, which is a fair point, Alan. That's a fair point. Um, fair point. Uh, let me go back over to Facebook for a moment. Um, Ricky Beasley, uh, Barry Watkins, Oliver Bonchick, kind of talking about Mike Bobo and kind of what happened in big games in the past. I'm going to stand by something that I have said before. And listen, I think it's right to wonder how good Mike Bobo will be as offensive coordinator. It's just only a natural tendency. And I am very open to the idea that some people who have been skeptical about Bobo 
if it turns out that the offense is scoring 31 points per game, you know, if, if they don't, you know, you know, if they're not producing explosive plays at a clip that's consistent with what Georgia did a year ago, then there'll be some people who get a chance to say, see, I told you so. And I'm totally fine with that. It's just the nature of sports arguments, right? We do that. But here is the one thing I emphatically believe about the past. If you look at, you know, Georgia and kind of big games from sort of the Bobo era when he was offensive coordinator here. If you look at the thing that sort of held Georgia back from being a national champion or being a, you know, whatever, I, you know, um, I just don't think Mike Bobo was anywhere near the top of the list of things that was keeping Georgia from being a championship level team back then. They're close a couple of times, didn't quite break through. And the reason they didn't break through, I don't believe it's Mike Bobo. I just don't. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. All right. Uh, all right. So Kent Holcomb uh, giving us an update on his situation. Kent's been battling uh, cancer here. And he says, I'm going to try to still be here as much as possible to have hopefully I'll uh, be the last surgery to get uh, this out this week. Y'all be kind while I'm gone and know I'll be checking in when I can. Kent, we are thinking about you. We're praying about you. We love your fight. Uh, you inspire all of us, and I mean that. I, I love seeing you at dognation.com, uh, Facebook. You can have one of those guys that sort of toggle us back, the various comment sections, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, this place not the same, is not the same when you're not here. You bring a lot to the conversation. I really, really appreciate that, and I really, really am rooting hard for you. Uh, rooting hard for you to be feeling better uh, very, very soon. We hope we get that. Graham Nicholson, also on the subject of Mike Bobo, saying uh, – that Bobo's got a lot more talent now than he used to have worked with in the past, and that is true there as well. Uh, so, Kent, we're thinking hard about you. We appreciate that. Great comments here. Um, Devil Dog also to go and go back to the complimentary football conversation we had earlier. Said, "Let's all agree, it takes a great offense and defense to win the national championship." I would say that is very much true, for sure. Jay Scheib says that Mike Bobo is the ultimate scapegoat. Kind of turned into that, didn't it? Uh, and listen, South Carolina 2014, totally warranted, I believe. Uh, mistakes were made <laughs> at the goal line there, not giving the ball to Todd Gurley. Uh, but, you know, some of the criticism sort of kind of grew at a pace that just didn't really make a ton of sense. So I think, Jay, you're probably right about that. Um, Uh, by the way, you got Paul Moon, some of our YouTube folks, also um, giving some love over to Kent Holcomb, and I appreciate that there, too. Ooh, Bill Bixby. How about this? He says that uh, Mike Bobo is going to average more points than Todd Munkin. That's a strong take. If that turns out to be true, Bill, you definitely get a chance to take a bow. Uh, that's good stuff. Uh, that's that's good stuff. Um, all right. Oh, we got to go for now. Thanks for being here. Y'all check out the Atlanta Journal-Constitution online, AJC.com. Uh, you got all kinds of stuff going on, Brave Spring Training, Falcons Draft stuff. you got some great, great things taking place there. So you can follow all of that. you also got the, you know, you got some real new stuff going on there too. We obviously don't talk about that, but you can follow all of that there as well. Uh, but it's there for you, AJC.com, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Make sure you check that out. Also, our friends at RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. Uh, it's been warm the last few days, which is a reminder that spring's going to be here before you know it, which means your air conditioning unit's going to be ready for that. So go ahead and get it tuned back up to factory fresh specs. Find it online, rsandrews.com. Get that air conditioning unit working properly, keeping you nice and cool and comfortable all spring and summer long. Time to start thinking about that online, rsandrews.com. Have a great day. Back tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. We will look forward to talking to you then.